I'm Claudia Catania, and you're listening to Playing on Air. Gun Show was commissioned by the Gilchrist Foundation and additionally supported by the generosity of Phyllis and Joel Ehrlich. You are about to hear Gun Show, presented in front of a live audience at Playwrights Horizons in New York City. It was written by David Auburn. His plays and screenplays include Lost Lake, The Lake House, and Proof, for which Mr. Auburn won the Pulitzer Prize and the Tony Award. Gun Show is directed by Wendy Goldberg, the Artistic Director of the National Playwrights Conference at the Eugene O'Neill Center in Connecticut, and a frequent director at regional theaters all over the country. Gun Show features Bobby Cannavale, Emmy winner for his work on Will and & Grace, and HBO's Boardwalk Empire, Issa Davis of House of Cards, The Wire, and Broadway's Passing Strange, Lucy DeVito of Hulu's Deadbeat, Martha Plimpton, whose stage work has earned her three Tony nominations and on TV stars in Raising Hope, The Real O'Neills, and is an Emmy winner for The Good Wife, and David Furr, Tony nominee for Noises Off and TV presence on Madam Secretary and The Blacklist. We'll check in with the whole creative team after David's play. So first, gun show. We are at a restaurant in a big city. Two couples have just been seated. So this place is wonderful. We've been dying to try it's it. It's our new date night go-to every Wednesday night. We need a place. Why don't we have a place? We had the Italian place. Pretty good local. Mm-hmm. Nothing special, but reliable. It closed six months ago. You know what opened up? Hmm. A bank. <laughs> Of course. No, it was a drugstore. The bank is on the other corner. That's right. It's new, too. What was there before the bank? I can't even, I can't even remember. A different bank. That's right. Ah, <laughs> oh, they sprout like mushrooms. What is happening to this city? Well, ask him. It's his fault. Oh, stop it. It's not his fault. It's not your fault. He can defend himself. It's okay. If you're in commercial real estate in this town, you get a lot of crap. I don't mind. I'm used to it. Well, why are there so many bank branches? That's what I don't understand. What's the incentive for them? How can it be worth it for them? I just don't believe it could be. It is. (laughs) They know what they're doing. I'm hungry. What's good here? Everything. I'm thinking about the tilapia. Oh, that I don't recommend. Oh. (laughs) Also, well, see... It's not the kind of place where you order an individual entree. Uh, they kind of have a Good different... Good evening. So- How is everybody tonight? Great. Thanks. Good. Outstanding. Have you dined with us before? Many, many times. Perfect. So you know we do tapas style small plates and we do strongly encourage sharing and experimentation. For a party of four, I'd recommend between 12 and 16 items to start. And you can see they're divided into four columns. All the columns in column C are vegan and gluten free and availability is limited on some items. We do source directly from the listed farms and fisheries, and unfortunately, we are already out of the ramp crostini. <laughs> Got it. I'll give you a minute. Uh, can I bring anyone some drinks in the meantime? Oh, for God's sake. What are you doing? Put your phone away. I'm sorry. I just got a text alert. There was another shooting in Ann Arbor. Oh, no. What does it say? Well, they don't know. Some guy went and shot up his office. <sighs> Four dead? No. It's just awful. It's awful. Every day, it seems like. Every other day. I know Ann Arbor. Ugh. Some of my high school friends went to school there. Oh, it's, it's like a gut punch. Well, he got him, at least, looks like. The police shot him. He's not expected to survive. Please put the phone away. <laughs> Look, it's happening. It'd be wrong just to ignore that it. That doesn't mean we have to think about it this minute. It's just terrible, and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, w- uh, the official death toll is now six. Will you please put the phone away? Yeah, okay, sorry. You're right? Sorry. So what can I get you folks to drink? (laughs) Oh, um, uh, we'll have a look at the wine list. Um, But just some water would be fine for now. Still sparkling or tap? Uh, tap? No problem. And some bread would be good. No problem. 
Since when does no problem mean yes? <laughs> no, right? It's waiters speak. It's like, it's like when they say, you still working on that? <laughs> no, I'm not working. I'm <laughs> eating. I'm not doing hard labor. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just... These people with their guns, these men. Uh, they're not all men. Most of them, the vast, vast majority. Hey, come on, honey, let's just, let's not. What? Let's not what? Well, I don't know. I mean, what else is there to say? You just said it. I'm agreeing with you. We can't ignore it. I think it's an important subject if we can't talk about well, it. I just wonder, though, if it trivializes it to turn it into, you know, a dinner table chit chat. Yeah, you can trivialize anything. Oh, right. Sure. No, absolutely. But. You know, we're all just trying to relax and... <laughs> okay, okay, we won't discuss anything real. Let's talk about a new TV series or some ugly dress some actress wore at some award show. <laughs> oh, fine. I mean, let's talk about the shootings if you want to. I don't I... want to. Nobody wants to. We should be able to talk about uncomfortable things, that's all. But it's not uncomfortable, right? I mean, isn't that the real issue? If we all essentially agree about that... You know, these people, these maniacs. These men, they are always men. Th that's not fair. A woman was part of the one in Denver a couple weeks ago. Uh, there are girl gun nuts, too. Still the overwhelming majority. I, I mean, the gun thing, it's some kind of overcompensation. It's a penis substitute. That's facile. Uh, well, they're definitely overcompensating for something. I think it's maybe too easy for us in our little bubbles to say that Oh, I am so sick of that bubble garbage. <laughs> Everybody's in a bubble. It doesn't mean I don't have the right to an opinion. No, of course you do. Nobody's saying I mean, you yes, right I'm in a bubble, but they're in their own bubbles. The only difference is they have guns in there with them in their bubbles. <laughs> Oh, did you see the footage of those clowns in Texas or somewhere carrying their shotguns into a donut they shop? They were rifles. Well, whatever they are. They, they look like machine guns. They're semi-automatics. Well, a, a whole bunch of them went into a donut shop or a chain restaurant of some kind. It was a Chili's. And, and, <laughs> and they're filming the whole thing. One of them is filming it on his phone like it's a reality show. I saw that. It went viral. Half of them are overweight. They're obese. What does that have to do? What does that have to do with anything? I think it probably has a lot to do with it. How? I think How, that... Who cares if they're overweight? I think they're overcompensating. You think they're fat losers. Why don't you just say that? Okay, I think they're fat losers. We, we don't know if they're losers. They might have good jobs. They think they're Clint Eastwood. That's the fantasy, right? That's the fantasy we're all indulging. That's the trade-off. A couple of thousand shooting deaths each year, kids or cops, school teachers, whoever, the congresswoman, Gabby, whatever, married to the astronaut. Uh, Gifford. This lovely woman gets half her brain blasted away so a bunch of fat losers can keep alive the fantasy. When they're not sitting on their asses playing shoot 'em up video games or looking at porn, then in a standoff, in a Tarantino movie standoff, they'd be Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood never did a Tarantino movie. Oh, or whoever. <laughs> Wait, there was something I wanted to say before we got on the Texas thing. Damn it, what was it? So, have you had a chance to look at the wine list? Oh, uh, no. <sighs> I'm sorry. We'll just have a look. And, and we need to order food, too. Um, you know wines. Pick something. Uh, I'll tell you what. Just bring whatever bottle's the second cheapest. <laughs> no problem. White or red? Red. Perfect. That's a little embarrassing. <laughs> Second cheapest? That's how I always pick. It is? I thought you knew what you were ordering. It usually works out pretty well. <laughs> what was that perfect thing? Yeah, everything's perfect. It's another thing they've started saying. Some restaurant consultant must have decided. Oh, you know, I remember. Hmm. What? What I was going to say, it's about the Constitution. Okay. <laughs> that I think it's clear from everything that's been written and from the history. Oh, God. <laughs> now it really does sound trivial. No, go on. No, no, forget you it. Just say it. All right. It's that I don't think the Second Amendment means at all what these people say it means, that it's gotten completely twisted from what the founders intended. Well, I think that's an excellent point. You know what would be good? 
If Tarantino and Eastwood did work together, <laughs> it seems like a natural fit. Why haven't they? Eastwood directs his own films. Not always. Yeah, mostly though. Did, did anybody see the one about John Coltrane? Bird? Excellent film. It's Charlie Parker. Are you sure? Positive. Forrest Whitaker plays Charlie Parker. That's why it's called Bird. He's a huge jazz buff. I hate the word buff. But, <laughs> but Coltrane played the sax too, or was it trumpet? No, no tenor sax. Did they ever play together? You know, there is one photo of them together on stage in the club with Miles Davis in the 40s. Yeah, just a photo, no known recording. But if one turned up, it would be incredible. It would be like the Dead Sea Scrolls. I guess my point is, why have we allowed the Second Amendment to become so distorted? I mean, it's right there in the words. A well-regulated militia. Mm -hmm. That's gun control. You're right. You're absolutely right. Now, I don't know how you get that across to people. I have a gun. What? I have a gun. Handgun. No, you don't. He's joking. I'm not. He doesn't. I do. <laughs> I got it about a month ago. Where? Gun show. When did you go to a gun show? Uh, about a month ago. You're joking. No, I went to a gun show in Pennsylvania. Okay, here we go. The Sonoma Cab Merlot blend, the producer's biodynamic, they supply directly to us, and it has a fruit-forward underlayer with the contrapuntal notes of apricot, cumin, lavender, and asphalt. <laughs> Who'd like to taste? Just pour it, I'm sure it's fine. Nah, I'll try it. <laughs> Did you really get a gun? Yeah. Do you have a license? You don't need a license. What, you don't? That's the whole problem, that any idiot can go out and get a gun. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's true. You don't need a license for a rifle or a shotgun in the state. How do they know if you know how to use it? Who's they? Exactly. <laughs> However, I bought a handgun, and I got a license. It's not difficult. So? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know what? It's very nice. Thank you. No problem. Why didn't you tell me you bought a gun? I knew you wouldn't like it, and it never came up. Why? I, I don't know, it just never came up. No, why did you buy it? Oh, well, all the shootings. After the one at the school, I couldn't sleep. You didn't tell me that. I didn't want to upset you. Well, you should have talked to me. If you were having trouble sleeping, I, I mean, this isn't the dark ages. Insomnia is treatable, anxiety is treatable. You, you, you could have... Yeah. Seen somebody. I don't want therapy. I want to be able to defend myself. From who? I don't know. That's the point. Okay, we don't know where the next threat will come from. They could be anywhere. Who's they? Exactly. Who are you? I, I cannot believe what you are saying right now. Well, I'd like to be able to protect you too. Oh, leave me out of it, thanks. You know, at the risk of being accused of triviality, did anyone read the Times Magazine piece a couple weeks back about traveling through China by rail? We were thinking about doing that, weren't we? The bad guy with a gun, that's who they are, right? And you'll be the good guy with a gun? Is that it? Come on, you two. I'll be the guy who's not helpless. See, this, this is the fantasy. You will be helpless. M maybe, I, I don't know. There's no way to know until it happens. Oh yeah, there is. Because we know what happens to trained soldiers all the time when they get into these situations. They shoot each other. They shoot themselves by accident. Or police officers who are supposed to know what they're doing are taking down innocent people. They're panicking or passing out or pissing themselves because life is not a movie. I'll grant you all that stuff happens. And you don't think it would happen to you? I don't know, it could. Maybe it probably would. <laughs> so? So what? So you're admitting you cannot be Clint Eastwood. I never said I could be Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood can't be Clint Eastwood. <laughs> He's about 85 years old, for one thing. <laughs> We're talking about gun smoke, Clint Eastwood. No, he wasn't on gun smoke, he was on Bonanza. That's wrong. Let's, let's just say a fistful of dollars, Clint Eastwood. Though I'm pretty sure he was on Bonanza. Yeah, but you thought John Coltrane was Charlie Parker. <laughs> Can we just... If a psycho 
walked into an elementary school tomorrow and you're the janitor mopping the floors and strapped to your hip, you've got your, what is it you bought? It's a Glock, semi-automatic. A Glock? What is that, a shotgun? I think you're thinking of a rifle. No, it's a handgun, a pistol. Oh, Jesus. Anyway, a psycho walks into a school. Don't make it a school. Not even hypothetically. Fine. A psycho walks in here. No, no, this restaurant. Not here. Well, where then? Where do, you, where do you want him to go? Nowhere. A supermarket. Okay? This madman runs into a grocery store spraying bullets everywhere. Tell me you wouldn't be cowering in the frozen food section like everybody else. Nobody knows ahead of time how they'd react. But the odds, the overwhelming odds, yeah, sure. are that I... you, with your gluck, or your glack, or your gleek, or your glock, or would either be paralyzed and helpless, or you'd make things worse. Okay, so what? So what? Could I see your glock sometime? No! Sure. Uh, why? I'm just curious. I've never held a gun. I don't want you firing his gun. Well, I don't need your permission, and I don't need to fire it. I just... Want to check it out? No. What, what difference does it make to you? <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to hold it. I'm not going to do anything with I'll it. I'll take you to the gun range. When have you been to a gun range? I had to learn how to use it. Really? Great. Let, let's do it. When? Oh, my God. Listen to you. Well, I'd sort of like to go to one of those gun shows, too, just for the experience. God, this is so male. Penis substitute. Uh, Pure penis substitute. That's... Fassel. Listen to the way you talk about it. Just let me touch it. I just want to hold it. I just want to see if it feels like... You know what else it is? It's gay. So gay. Oh, that's, that's real progressive of you to use a homophobic slur to shame that... us when just the other day you were saying gender nonconformity is the new normal. You know what? Fine. Go to the gun show. Live out your little bloodletting sicko fantasy. Maybe the real fantasy is assuming that you know anything about it when neither of us have the experience. And maybe if we just got out of our little bubbles once in a while... I like my bubble. I like it, and I'll stay right here in it. Thanks. Still can't believe you bought this thing and didn't tell me. Where do you keep it? Is it in our apartment right now? Wait, are you even listening to me? What are you doing? Rawhide. What? I googled it. Rawhide. Eastwood on Rawhide. That's right. Rawhide. See this? He thinks he can take down a madman in a supermarket? You'd be too busy googling <laughs> how to take down a madman in a supermarket. All right, all right, all right. Look, you want to talk odds? I'll give you odds for the supermarket. Let's say the odds are, I don't know, 90% I'd be ineffective. 90% you'd be panicking and pissing yourself. Fine. Make it 95 if you want. Make it 99. Fine. I think that's too high, but all right. That still leaves a 1% chance, at minimum, that I'm better off than I would be without a weapon. 1%? I'll take a 1% chance of saving my life or saving the life of a child or, or a mother with a baby in the supermarket over nothing. Who wouldn't? And, and, and I say 1% is low. I think it would be 3 or 5. Uh, 5? Five. There was a water bug in the bathroom last week. You made me come and kill it. I didn't have my shoes on. If you'd had your Glock on you, you could have taken that water bug down. <laughs> you feel lucky, bug, do you? Bro, I would have squashed that bug if I had shoes on. I've killed more than my share of bugs and roaches, be fair. People aren't roaches. No, a guy who's shooting children is worse. I think he's worse than a roach. He's worse than anything. And I think even the smallest infinitesimal sliver of a hope against a creature like that is better than surrender. Now you can call that a fantasy. Maybe it is. Maybe a chance that small borders on fantasy. But I'll still take fantasy over no hope at all. Take that over the certainty of dying, screaming in the frozen food section, or watching children die and doing nothing. I guess it's just how I feel. Who are you? I don't even know who you are. So, have we had a chance to make some selections? Oh. Uh, oh. No, sorry. It's okay. Take your time. We're all going to focus on it now, we promise. It, it's no problem. Take your time. 
Oh, it looks so good. What'd she say about column C again? Uh, locally sourced. No. Vegan. Oh. <laughs> right. It's all locally sourced. Right. Okay. Well, we better decide. Everything's good here. You just heard Gun Show, co-presented with Playwrights Horizons in New York City and recorded in front of a live audience. It was written by David Auburn and directed by Wendy Goldberg. You heard Bobby Cannavale and Issa Davis as couple one, Martha Plimpton and David Furr as couple two, and Lucy DeVito as the waiter. Gun Show was commissioned by the Gilchrist Foundation and supported by Phyllis and Joel Ehrlich. Additional thanks to the New York State Council on the Arts, the Horace W. Goldsmith Foundation, and Josie Merck. David Auburn, playwright. The Gilchrist Foundation commissioned this play um, and gave you carte blanche. Why did you choose this subject? Well, it's all around, right? Um, I mean, I wrote the play a couple months ago, and of course, you know, it became timely again a few weeks ago. Uh, apart from the specific subject, I guess the, f you know, the, f the feeling I was trying to get after a little bit was, was the feeling that we all have when we're you know, trying to process these enormous events that are happening out there. And they get mixed up with the triviality of your life and the ways you try to enjoy your life and the arguments you have with your spouse. I mean, I wanted to sort of write something where all that stuff gets mixed up together in a way that felt realistic and sort of uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, director Wendy Goldberg and Martha and Issa and Lucy, are guns a man's thing? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things are a man's thing, or a, at least a power thing. Let's say mm -hmm. that. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and it's far too complicated and nuanced and d difficult to get into in this setting and with the time we have but I think it's fair to say that there's a certainly an obvious reason why people talk about it because m most of the people who are responsible for these mass shootings are men. Well I think the responsibility that we have is around gender roles which are socialized and are cultural and if we m make it okay for you know all of our kids and all of our stories to be around violence in a way that isn't sort of recognized uh as um, you know, something that is just the fun of aggression that is in us, but actually is about dehumanization. If we can, yeah. that's where our responsibility lies. Violence is a man thing, globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, guns are an American <laughs> thing. <laughs> no, I mean, I think you make an excellent point. Mm -hmm. Violence is most often perpetuated and expressed around the world by men for whatever reason. And I think you make an excellent point about uh, gender roles and patriarchy and all of this, but guns are American, very much American. Well, speaking of guns, um, Bobby Cannavale, uh, as an actor, you've probably handled a fair amount of guns. In your case in Clint, it really is a fantasy when you, when you handle them for work. Have you realized anything about guns just by virtue of playing with them? The first time I handled a gun at work was trip was a trip. It was it was. Nobody taught me anything about it. They just showed it to me and they said it's unloaded and they clicked it back and they gave it to me and, and I thought, no one's taught me how to do this. No one taught me how to pull the trigger. I guess it's, it's just an assumption that you know how to do this. Yeah. It's sort of presented in a way that's very, like it's a toy and it's not a toy, of course. And the first time that I handled it, I remember being really sort of freaked out by that and I immediately went, it was in Los Angeles, and I immediately that weekend I asked somebody if they would take me to a range so that I can think, know how to work these things and understand their power and um, you know they're, they're killing machines, they're incredibly powerful instruments of death and, and since then yeah I've handled them many times in movies and television and all that and 
Yeah, it's uh, gosh, what are you gonna do? I mean, I play a lot of people, a lot of killers. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> gotta make a living. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't own a gun. I don't. I don't believe in owning a gun. Yeah. yeah. I had a different experience than Bobby. I was doing a movie, and but it was a, it was uh, it was a war movie, so there were you know you show up early, and there were Navy former Navy SEALs. Uh, there to put you through some training. In, in that instance, they want you to look like you really know what you're doing. And, you know, we, were, we didn't know exactly what we'd be getting into. We might have to be trading, you know, changing out magazines mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And David, so for luckily, I had th this is the Benghazi film? Yeah. Luckily, they gave me some training on, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, which is good because, you know, I'd never handled M5 <laughs> rifles before. Mm -hmm. and. And you don't want veterans laughing at no, you. No, no, I mean, and also, <laughs> you know, in that particular thing, we were portraying real people. Yeah. But, but the, the, in, in, in my experience, it's a, lo it's a lifetime of various uh, exposure to guns of different types, shotguns, you know, fired my first shotgun when I was 10 years old uh, in the woods at a, you know, a friend's house in the country and we learned at a very early age to have respect for the weapon, how to use it. And that is a very, that is the, the most common American experience with people, with children who grow up around, you know, rural Americans who, who, ha whose guns are integrated into their cultural lives. I also have the experience of, you know, playing shoot 'em ups in movies and having a gun or in a TV show or whatever. I don't know, it, it's what comes up for me reading this play. I, I don't really become sort of wrapped up in the gun debate reading this play for some reason. Somehow for me, reading this play, I become more, I'm, I'm more sort of um, intrigued by the ways in which we process these sort of uh, cultural conversations, the way they're integrated into marriage conversations, socially, what class has to do with it. The, the, the thing about a guy who decides in this time of turmoil and male diminishment culturally that this is the time he should have a gun. You know, these are the things I'm thinking about in the play, but larger, bigger, like, political conversations about gun control and stuff. Yeah. Hmm. I don't, it doesn't it's, it's, wake, it's, wake up. I don't... Well, I feel like, I mean, it does, it does for me. I mean, I feel, I feel like the play is really about a pr proliferation of fear, which turns mm -hmm. into a proliferation of guns. And I, I mean, I similarly have, spending time in Birmingham growing up, also had that experience of, mm -hmm. you know, shooting at a young age, but then also have the experience on the other side of the gun where I've had a gun to my head, yeah. you know, in my own driveway. I've, my father was shot by a cop. Um, so, you know, I, I, uh, I was held up at gunpoint as well. Yeah. So, um, and your character, Martha, your character strikes me as the most anxious at the table in a way. She's the one who most often tells her husband to put his cell phone away. And I'm just wondering, do you think that one of the things that might be feeding our collective anxiety is being constantly plugged in? That's an excellent point, and, and perhaps that's true. I hadn't thought of it. I was thinking on a much more of you know straightforward level about um a woman who seems to just want to be in a controlling situation with her husband at a table in which <laughs> the dynamic is mm -hmm. you know you know what i'm saying yeah let's do it again because i want to have that in my mind <laughs> when I'm doing it. um isa and david's play martha's character says i like my bubble why is it that you think people today are so often unwilling to leave familiar territory essentially they're they're allergic to people with different mindsets. Sure. Um, Wendy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's, again, it's, it's, very, it's very frightening and difficult, I think, to be outside of your comfort zone and to not know exactly what's going to be coming at you. As, an enlightened, as enlightened people, we're trying to be sort of both protective of what we believe in, but also, and, and our families and, you know, who we are, but at the same time be open to other perspectives. And, uh, and I think it's hard, it's very difficult to have, to hold both of those things, I think, present at the same time. And so I think that we strive for these things, that's the hope. Um, but sometimes it's tough. Sometimes we have to be protective of, of who we are and what we believe and because we, and we, we know it's going to be met with you know, difficulty and criticism. And so it's, I think it's um, a real a huge yeah. challenge. Yeah. And there's other things that, that David brings up. Um, the characters have pet 
peeves in terms of language, such as people saying, you know, no problem when there is no problem, or perfect or outstanding when the thing is neither perfect nor outstanding. David, why did you bring that up? Well, it's the messiness of a conversation, right? I mean, I think, you know, I wanted to have these moments where you're, you know, you're engaged with this giant public policy issue, but then you want to remember was Clint Eastwood on Gunsmoke or Bonanza? And that suddenly assumes an importance, at least, I mean, I've been in a situation where it assumes importance in my mind where I cannot stop myself from pulling my phone out. So, and it's, <laughs> and it's, and I don't like that, you know, in myself, but I recognize it as being part of the sort of tug of war on your attention that, that, that you deal with, you know, in the way we live now. I'm afraid I could talk forever about this, but I have to wrap it up. So I want to thank David for teaching me how to order wine. And I want to thank all of you for being here and sharing your time and your talent with Playing On Air. Thank you. Thank you. you. You've been listening to Playing On Air, great American short plays with great American actors. Theme and play music by Tom Cocham. Recording and sound design by John Kilgore. Associate producer, Sasha Spitzer. Literary and Development Management, Lucy Fleming. Marketing, David Mayhew. Social Media, Jenna Lauren Freed. Assistant to the producer, Bonnie Antosh. Distributed by PRX, Public Radio Exchange. We invite you to visit our website at playingonair.org where you can stream short plays and find information about our artists and plays. Join us on Facebook or Twitter and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. While you're there, leave us a review. We value your opinion. For Playing On Air, I'm your host, Claudia Catania. Thanks for listening.